Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The state continues to update its plan for who can register for the COVID-19 vaccine and when. We just don't know when we're going to get a big bump in our vaccine dosages. I mean, we've consistently been told through the end of January, 79,000 doses a week. Ahead, who's eligible now? And when will the state open up the vaccine to more Hoosiers? The House impeached President Trump for the second time in the wake of last week's insurrection at the Capitol. Coming up, how Indiana's congressional delegation voted and what it means with less than a week remaining before Joe Biden is sworn in as president. The federal government carried out more executions this week at the correctional facility in Terre Haute, including the first woman in nearly 70 years. Will the end of the Trump administration bring a halt to federal executions? These stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, about a quarter million Hoosiers have registered for the COVID-19 vaccine. The state continues to expand eligibility and people aged 70 and older can now sign up for an appointment. The state's top health officials say they're prioritizing older Hoosiers because they're most likely to be hospitalized or die from the virus. But as Pat Bean reports, some critics are frustrated because they say the state isn't following recommendations for the Centers for Disease Control. Indiana state officials say their COVID-19 vaccine rollout plan is working as designed. But there's still no word on when younger Hoosiers, including frontline workers and those with underlying conditions that put them at higher risk, will be able to get it. State Health Commissioner Dr. Chris Box acknowledges the state's rollout is different from guidance issued this week by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Our goal is to reduce deaths and hospitalizations, and that makes this the right approach. Our system is working and we are going to stick with it. More than 78% of the state's deaths are among Hoosiers age 70 and older. Box can't provide a timeline for when more Hoosier populations will be able to get the vaccine. We just don't know when we're going to get a big bump in our vaccine dosages. I mean, we've consistently been told through the end of January, 79,000 doses a week. Box said if another vaccine maker, like Johnson & Johnson, gets federal approval, that will help the rollout. So far, about a quarter million Hoosiers have received their first coronavirus shot, and about 50,000 have gotten their second. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Uh, you can register at ourshot.in.gov. If you're in need in, of assistance, you can call 211 or Indiana's area agencies on aging. Well, COVID-19 cases, deaths, hospitalizations, and positivity rates decline nearly every day this week. It's according to Indiana Department of Health. Indiana began the year averaging 74 deaths a day from the virus with a positivity rate of 16%. Now, as of Thursday, those averages were down to 42 deaths a day with a 15.3% seven-day positivity rate. Indiana's average number of cases dipped to just under 4,600 and hospitalizations haven't fallen uh, to their lowest number in two months. The state has reported more than 580,000 cases and about 9,000 deaths since the pandemic began. Well, lawmakers are debating whether to give the General Assembly more opportunities to cancel a governor's public emergency order. As Brandon Smith reports, the legislation is a direct reaction to some lawmakers' frustration with Governor Eric Holcomb during the COVID-19 pandemic. When the pandemic started in March, the governor used the power of executive orders to put COVID-19 restrictions in place. He can declare a public emergency, like the health emergency during the pandemic, for 30 days. And there's no limit on how many times it can be renewed. Holcomb has done it 10 times since March. 
The General Assembly can already halt an emergency order, but only if it's in session to do so. And when the legislature isn't in session, only the governor can call a special session. A bill presented this week would change that. Republican Representative Matt Lehman says under his measure, an emergency order could only initially be renewed after 30 days if the legislature is in session or if the governor calls a special session. If this is a good order and it needs to extend, this General Assembly is not compelled to act. After that initial renewal, a public emergency could only run for 60 more days before the General Assembly was called into special session again, and then 60 days after that, and so on. If this bill had been in place during the current pandemic, the governor would have had to call a special session at least four times. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brandon Smith. The governor's state budget proposal includes money for a lot of one-time expenses, but provides very little relief for Hoosiers suffering through the COVID-19 pandemic. It would spend $1.13 billion over the next two years on initiatives such as paying down debt, broadband expansion, and cash funding a swine barn at the state fairgrounds. Why would we not increase dollars for food banks for the human infrastructure of people who are in need of, of food? Holcomb's proposed state budget does increase K-12 to funding by $377 million over the next two years. That's an increase from current spending of 2% in the first year and an additional 1% the second year. But otherwise, state spending would be that from the current budget. Well, this week, Donald Trump is the first president in history to be impeached twice. Some Republicans join Democrats in supporting impeachment. But as Brock Turner reports, Indiana's Republicans last all voted not to impeach Trump, with many citing the country's need to move on. The seven Republican and two Democratic U.S. representatives from Indiana did not break from their respective parties Wednesday in the historic impeachment vote. Accusations must go through the proper due process whether it's election fraud or an impeachable offense. And someone who did not support the objection to certification last week, I will not support this political charade today. And uh, I'm going to go over, over across the street and vote no on impeachment. Right now is the time to heal America, bring us back together. Next Wednesday, I'm going to be in my chair out on the steps of the Capitol, just like I was four years ago when Donald Trump was inaugurated to watch Joe Biden become the next president of the United States of America. Also among them was Vice President Mike Pence's older brother, Indiana Congressman Greg Pence, saying, quote, the president has made it clear he will support a peaceful transfer of power on January 20th to President-elect Joe Biden. It is time to move on, heal, and put our focus into where it truly helps the American people, recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and restoring our economy. No Indiana Republicans in Washington agreed to be interviewed for this piece, but Representative Andre Carson, a Democrat who represents much of Indianapolis and Marion County, called his decision to vote for impeachment a sad but necessary duty. The fact that the president would use his position and, and platform to incite mob attacks on police officers and uh, the U.S. Capitol. And not only is that unpatriotic, I think it's un-American. In addition to last week's Capitol attacks, Carson was the subject of further violence. According to the Department of Justice, an Alabama man was arrested this week after possessing multiple firearms and several Molotov cocktails with a note specifically mentioning Carson as a target near the Capitol. But Carson believes the violence is part of a broader problem. In his attempt to make America great again and paint himself as this super patriot and, and, and superhero, um, he actually jeopardized the state of our democracy. Aaron Dusso is a professor of political science at IUPUI in Indianapolis. He believes Indiana's GOP representatives supported Trump largely to appease their constituents, not because they believed the false information the president and the party disseminated around voter fraud. Dusso says it's unlikely the Hoosiers who tried to block Biden from becoming president will face any electoral consequences. Oh, no, 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 I mean, no. <laughs> so, absolutely not. Uh, I would expect they'll be just as success successful. They'll be successful until, uh, uh, you know, the Democratic Party in the state of Indiana uh, has a, you know, a better message, a better counterweight right now. I don't see them as a particularly organized or clear on how they you know, are actually trying to counter the Republicans within the state. He and other political scientists say voters typically have short memories. 
but most agree the ideology and nationalist message Trump has ushered in will prevail long after January 20th. Without any type of, you know, real repercussions for what they're doing, they're going to keep doing it because it wins them office. Um, so I'm not particularly optimistic in this kind of case. I don't think it's going away, and I don't think Trump being going away is going to end it. Uh, this is something that started long before he you know, came on the stage, uh, and I think it's going to continue. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. The National Association of Attorneys General penned a letter this week condemning last week's insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Attorneys general from across the country signed onto the document, but as Brock Turner reports, the signature of Indiana's newly elected AG, Todd Rokita, was notably missing. And his company. Todd Rokita was one of only four attorneys general who refused to sign the letter from the bipartisan group of state and territory officials. The letter called the insurrection a very dark day in America, and the attorneys general pledged as those charged with enforcing the law to make clear that violence like what happened at the Capitol would not go unchecked. Rokita says he did not sign the letter because the National Association of Attorneys General didn't release a similar letter following national unrest last summer. While most of the protests across the country in the wake of George Floyd's death were peaceful, there was violence and property damage in several U.S. cities, including Indianapolis. However, the correlation Rokita makes is a false equivalent, according to Dr. Emmett Riley, an associate professor and director of Africana Studies at DePaul University. You have a group of protesters who are calling attention to a real and systematic issue surrounding policing and inequality and the way in which police policing happens to majority black and communities of color. Riley says that's a stark contrast from what occurred last week at the United States Capitol. On the other hand, you have a group of white supremacists who are inspired by an impeached president who lost re-election that attempted to prevent a constitutional process in terms of uh, certifying the election results. So I think that these are clear distinctions here. Rokita issued a separate letter condemning the violence on office letterhead. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Rokita's letter came days after reports a group with ties to robocalls asking recipients to march on Washington to stop the steal provided over $1 million to Rokita and former Attorney General Curtis Hill in campaign donations. Rokita's campaign spokesman declined an interview but insisted he had no involvement with the calls. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We go back to Terre Haute for the latest on the final three executions scheduled to happen under the Trump administration. And the city cleared out the tent encampment at Seminary Park Thursday night. What's next for those experiencing homelessness in Bloomington? These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Stay close to Indiana News Desk as we trace education issues all the way from the Capitol to your child's classroom. So many topics that arise each year in the State House affect what happens every day in the schoolhouse. The WTIU News Team is committed to helping you stay up to date with the issues that affect your family's future. Keep yourself informed. Tune in to Indiana News Desk, your source for regional and state in-depth news. Welcome to the Amanpour on PBS. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London, giving you the global view. I've covered the world for nearly three decades, and I'm dedicated to bringing you all the facts. Please join me for conversations with newsmakers, world leaders. Good to be with you, Christiane. Artists and writers, the people who define, change, and challenge our world. That's Amanpour on PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Attorneys for Lisa Montgomery say the Trump administration violated the Constitution and federal law this week by executing their client who suffered from severe mental illness. On Wednesday, Montgomery became the first woman the federal government has put to death in nearly seven decades. Montgomery's execution came after hours of legal wrangling. Ultimately, the Supreme Court cleared the way for the execution to move forward. As a curtain was raised in the execution chamber, Montgomery glanced at journalists peering at her from behind thick glass. When you're in the room, um, you know, they're given the opportunity to give a final statement. And um, today, uh, she had a mask on, 
while she was already strapped to the gurney and they asked her if she had any final last words before they took that mask off of her. So to me, it looked like she maybe tried to respond. Um, so they took the mask off and then they asked her again uh, if she had any final statements and she just said no and she didn't say anything else. As the lethal injection began, Montgomery kept licking her lips and gasped briefly as pentabarbital, the lethal drug, entered her body through IVs on both arms. A few minutes later, her midsection throbbed for a moment, but quickly stopped. She was looking to her left and didn't really acknowledge um, anyone else in the room. Um, she had her eyes open, um, but seemed pretty calm and eventually just kind of closed her eyes. At 1.30 a.m., an official walked into the room, listened to her heart and chest, then walked out. She was pronounced dead a minute later. You know, I think for a lot of us, we expected to see a little bit more, but really, Lisa Montgomery, I mean, from the moment that we got in there, within 15 minutes, um, everything was done. The family of Bobby Joe Stinnett, the 23-year-old Montgomery killed in the northwest Missouri town of Skidmore in 2004, declined to comment on the execution. Montgomery used a rope to strangle Stinnett, who was eight months pregnant, and then cut the baby girl from Stinnett's womb with the kitchen knife. Montgomery took the child with her and attempted to pass the girl off as her own. Montgomery's legal team says she suffered sexual torture for years, including gang rapes as a child, permanently scarring her emotionally and exasperating mental health issues that ran in her family. The government executed another inmate last night and has an execution scheduled for tonight with less than a week until President-elect Biden is sworn into office. The attorneys for both men say their clients are recovering from COVID-19 and executing them would cause cruel and unusual punishment. The Supreme Court denied that argument Thursday night. Adam Pinsker reports. In 1993, a court convicted Corey Johnson of murdering seven people over a three-year span to further his drug empire in the Richmond, Virginia area. The very concerning thing about his case is that he has never had a chance to present that evidence in court, the full scope of the evidence. Um, no court has, has ever um, held a hearing to decide whether or not Mr. Johnson is intellectually disabled and therefore whether or not he's categorically exempt from the death penalty. Johnson's attorney, Donald Salzman, says the government withdrew a request to pursue a death sentence against one of his client's co-defendants because he was deemed to be intellectually incapacitated. He says Johnson scored well below the normal range for an IQ score on multiple tests. He was utterly incapable of learning in school. He repeated second grade three times. He also repeated third and fourth grade. Salzman says that his client had COVID-19 and executing him with the drugs the federal government uses in the lethal injection process could cause severe complications. Where we've um, had experts who have testified that um, COVID, as people may have heard, damages the lungs um, and exactly the same parts of the lungs that the drug that is used to execute people also damages. And our experts believe that um, because his COVID condition makes him particularly susceptible um, to that damage, um, that he is likely to suffer um, an unconstitutional um, execution experiencing the feelings of drowning and waterboarding. A third inmate scheduled for execution this week, Dustin Higgs, also had the coronavirus, and his attorney, Sean Nolan, says that x-rays showed damage to his client's lungs caused by the virus, and he says that Higgs isn't the only person on death row to have come down with the coronavirus. The number I heard today is 39 of the men on, on death row have tested positive. That's not a confirmed number through the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, but it's a number that I've heard. We represent a number of people there. Higgs was sentenced to death in 1996 for his role in murdering three people at a National Wildlife Refuge in Maryland. But his attorney, Sean Nolan, says Higgs's co-defendant, Willis Haynes, was the trigger man. And at his trial, uh, the government's theory was that he was the heavy. He was the one who did everything. This was, this was all Mr. Haynes and that he killed these women. Um, the jury deadlocked and he ended up getting a life sentence. The Department of Justice said in a press release last fall that Higgs's sentence and appeal were affirmed 17 years ago. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. 
For the past two weeks, Bloomington City officials warned those sleeping in tents overnight in Seminary Park must find shelter someplace else or be removed. As Ethan Burks reports, the city followed through with those warnings Thursday night. Just after 11 p.m., about two dozen Bloomington police officers, along with other city workers, arrived at Seminary Park to start removing tents and camping structures. The order was carried out despite many local organizations and several elected officials who say removing the encampments will only hurt people experiencing homelessness. People are kind of dispersing to other places in the community, which is re honestly really what we were afraid of and worried about, is that people would go and find campsites that are more hidden and, and far away, and so we'd have less access to them and less ability to kind of keep an eye on them. Gilmore drafted a letter to Mayor John Hamilton's office asking to put a moratorium on removing the Seminary Park encampment. The letter received over 1,500 signatures that included Monroe County Commissioners and a handful of members of the city and county councils. Please stop. Let's let's stop the evictions. Let's work together and find a find a common solution instead of trying to forcibly uh, remove people. The city began the removal process earlier in the day when sanitation workers showed up Thursday afternoon to clear the public right away along South College Avenue. Tents and other personal belongings were loaded onto truck trailers and transported to a parks and recreation maintenance building near Switchyard Park. This is their home. That's their neighborhood. That's where they feel comfortable. That's right next to all of their amenities that they can get, the food, the day shelter, the showers. Short of that, they would have to walk miles to just get warm clothes. Both Teller and Gilmore represent organizations who have been pleading with the city to hold off on tearing down the encampment for just a little bit longer. Everybody that has any involvement in this is simply asking for more time. We have things in the works that could solve this. Gilmore is proposing a new shelter in a yet to be disclosed warehouse just south of Seminary Park. He believes it'll help get more people out of the winter elements. We could probably open very quickly, uh, but we'll have to staff it up, which that's, that's what takes some time. And of course, we'll need financial support to do that. Gilmore says he thinks the budget will need $60,000 to get the shelter up and running. He says both Bloomington and Perry Townships have already donated $15,000 each and Beacon Inc. will be able to contribute another ten grand, leaving another $20,000 to meet the goal. Finding long-term solutions, instead of dehumanizing our community members that are experiencing homelessness, with actions such as showing up with a garbage truck, treating them like they're trash. And until long-term solutions have been made, I stand with the community members and ask those folks that are occupying Seminary Park to stay where they are. But by the time tents and personal belongings were stripped from the park grounds, very few people experiencing homelessness were in the park, looking for shelter elsewhere. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ethan Burks. Bloomington City Council Member Isabel Piedmont-Smith is one of the elected officials who signed the letter sent to the mayor. She says the council is currently writing legislation that would require a 15-day warning before closing down future encampments and, other pr and, and offer protections to all personnel items being removed. Well, Indiana's success on the football field this season paid off for head coach Tom Allen. Allen pocketed an extra $250,000 in contract bonuses. He earned $100,000 each for winning the Big Ten and American Football Coaches Association's Coach of the Year awards. And Indiana's appearance in the Outback Bowl earned him another $50,000. Had the Hoosiers won the bowl game, it would have meant another $50,000 for Allen. Instead, the season ended not as he hoped. Not finish the season the way we wanted to. It's still that's a, it's a big disappointment for myself and and uh, an emptiness there that uh, you know we can't go back and change. Allen becomes just the third IU coach to win the AFCA award, joining Bo McMillan in 1945 and John Pont in 1967. Allen has a 24 and 22 record in four years at Indiana. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend.
Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. WTIU Television and WFIU Radio make up the largest public news bureau, bringing you stories and information you need about your community and our state. Consistently recognized as one of the best news sources in Indiana, we strive to provide in-depth coverage to help you stay safe, informed, and understand the world around you. Join us on Indiana News Desk, your source for the latest in-depth local and state news. There's never been a more important time to make sure facts and the truth are driving conversation. Washington Week is an island of civil discourse in a chaotic media environment. On Friday night, we gather the best reporters in the nation to unpack what's really happening and have a conversation that's not about point of view, but about informing the American people. Washington Week, 